So you can trade whatever you want. You can trade when you want. You can also decide not to trade for, oh, I don't feel good today or this week or I'm too tired or whatever it is. So the ability to choose when and where and how you're going to trade is most people don't recognize and realize how much uh, edge there actually is now. Welcome back everyone to the MC Down with Dr. Andrew Meneker. We spoke a long, 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 long time ago, 2016. So good to have you back here, Andrew. Andrew is a trading psychologist working with primarily traders, professional traders, retail traders a little bit. So we'll discuss psychology, how to achieve a top-notch mindset. How's it going today, Andrew? Very good. Glad to be back. I know we're in the past, 2016 had a big effect on me. I really learned a lot from it in terms of journaling, in terms of like having the right habits for trading. Oh, good. So tell me a bit about kind of what's been going on since we last spoke. Yeah, well, I mean, so much is happening. Um, of course, you know, I'll share one thing that I've been uh, focusing on a lot in my work with uh, professional traders. I, I, I do this with retail individual traders as well, but many of them are actually not ready for this concept yet. Um, and the concept is this, the idea of uncertainty and risk are closely related, but they're not the same thing. And working towards decoupling them in our mind um, helps our performance immensely. And there's different ways to go about that. So that's one of the big things that I've been talking about. And I haven't, you know, I can maybe even share kind of a non-trading interesting story that I have on how I kind of came to that realization about the need to decouple uncertainty and risk. Um, it's kind of a cool story. So a long time ago, before I was a trader, this was in 1995 or four, it's a long time ago. And before I had ever worked with a trader, I was working as a consultant um, at the Alameda Naval Air Station here in the San Francisco Bay Area. It doesn't exist anymore, that air base. But while I was there, I was doing stress management training and just basic stuff. And then there was a day where one of the civilian employees showed up armed and wanted to kill himself and take out all the guards at the front gate. And uh, the commanding officer, the CO, paged me. This was before there were cell phones, paged me to come over and deal with the situation and said, look, you know, I've got all, all my guys out here, guns around the guy. I've got the risk contained. What do you think is going to happen? How are you going to deal with this? And I said, I'm going to try and create a relationship with him, earn his trust and get him to lay down his weapons is my plan. About two hours later, nothing had really changed. He came up to me and he whispered in my ear. He said, so what's, what's happening? What do you think is going to, you know, what's going to happen? And I said, I don't know. And he said, well, I just want to remind you that I've got the risk contained. No matter what happens, if he reaches for that trigger, I've got the risk contained. Just, I want you to take care of things for me in a peaceful way. And then he walked away and it dawned on me in that moment, a team that I'd never thought about this before that moment, but this is a military guy who understands that uncertainty and risk are related, but he treats them very differently. And he was telling me that they're different. And it, and it was actually a few months after that is when I first began working with my first uh, traders. They were at Wells Fargo's bank, Wells Fargo Bank here in SF. My first experience in markets was working with bank traders. And right away, I realized that these guys are working with risk, managing risk, big time risk managers. That's their primary duty. But then they're also facing uncertainty. And so I realized I'm going to use my experience from the naval base thing, my consulting, to kind of bring that into my trading psychology. And that's something I've been working with a lot recently. I, I'm recognizing that a lot of traders are wrestling with this uncertainty versus risk um, di uh, dynamic. It's a big, big deal. So, Interesting. Now, I'm sure we're going to hear the rest of that story, but why move to trading? Like you could think that helping people is a lot <laughs> yeah. better than trading. So why trading for you is so fascinating? Yeah, it's fun. good question. So, I mean, when I finished my PhD, I had a lot of student loan debt, put myself through school, needed some money. There's a lot of psychologists in the Bay Area, a very competitive market for someone like me. And um, I got lucky with that uh, military consulting gig that got in the newspaper, that event, that situation. Wells Fargo heard about it, had me come in and decided to hire me on as a consultant. I had no experience in markets, never even, this is a disclosure here, I never even had an economics class or even a business class in college. I was all about science and psychology and sports. So um, as soon as I got my first taste of the markets, working with traders and watching markets, I got bit by the bug. Um, and I realized, gosh, I want to be, I want to participate in this. So I kind of got really into my own trading. It took me a long time to 
um, figure out how to keep the money. I was very good at making money, but I wasn't very good at keeping it. it took me a long time to figure that out. Um, and then I realized pretty early on that trading is not just a way to make money. It's a vehicle for self-growth. And being a psychologist and someone who's really into self-growth, I thought, wow, this is an incredibly powerful vehicle for me. I can grow a lot and hopefully I can make some money at it as well. So that's, that's what got me in and why, I, why I'm still in. So yeah. tell me more about that. So trading is a way for you to grow and become better. Tell me more about yeah, what and how, a, how you can grow in trading. Incredibly powerful vehicle for self-growth. I mean, on the one hand, you have to be, you have to learn how to tolerate discomfort. That's the basics, right? The discomfort of waiting, you may miss out. The discomfort of being in a trade that's working, but it's starting to stall out. And you don't know if you should book all your profits now or let some ride or what do you do? Um, all of the discomforts, right, that we face, that having to book a loss and then it turns right around and goes back in your direction and maybe goes to where you thought it was going to go initially and you're not on the trade after you book your loss. All those forms of discomfort are normal parts of trading. And the traders who are the most successful are the ones who are able to tolerate those forms of discomfort. And to tolerate that takes a lot of growth because we're not equipped to tolerate losing and missing out. It's, the brain's not wired for that. And then the other aspect of the self-growth, I mean, there's many aspects. The other big aspect for me is um, it really helps me to understand uh, who I am as a person so I can become the best version of me. I can't trade like someone else. I can only trade like me, but I can be the best version of me. So that requires learning about my intuition, separating that from my emotion, how to distinguish the two. Um, and so there's so much that one can do as a trader that generally will translate into self-growth if you do it the right way. Interesting. So I know a lot of traders who, let's say, because you mentioned before about risk versus the discomfort. These are two different things. A lot of people get into trading, they have pretty much no way to control risk. Then they start to learn about the risk a little bit more. They start to control the risk better, but they still like the part of being able to deal with uncertainty and discomfort. So how do you yeah. train yourself to deal with those things? Because you're going to have to deal with them at some point. Yeah, there's a lot of things. So, um, so first of all, you know, when we're, we're facing risk or uncertainty or both, we're usually facing both at the same time, it, the, the brain's job is to keep us alive. Not to think, it's to keep us alive. And so what's going to happen is um, all of a sudden we're going to be in a state where our uh, survival is on the line, not just our financial survival, but our, our sort of our ego, our self-worth is on the line. And so it's learning how to tolerate the assaults on our ego, on our sense of self-worth, who, who, we, who we think we are, who we wanna be. And there's a lot of discomfort when the market's not doing what we want it to do. Um, it, it takes some real effort and some really deep work to do that. There's a lot of stuff out there in trading psychology that I'll just say, frankly, is nice sounding, but it doesn't work that well in the trenches. Um, uh, and I'm all about what works well. What sounds good may not be what actually works. So how do you differentiate from that? How you know like what is likely to work and not work? Can you know as a trader different with or each, yeah. do you have to- Well, it's different someone? for each with each person. One thing that I can share with your, your listeners and viewers that will probably help to some degree, it might help some people a lot. And this is an eye-opening experience that I many of my retail clients will have is when I share with them that, and I might even use a very specific example or I might talk about it more in generally, about a professional trader who is going through the exact same experiences, the exact same emotions, I should say, anxieties, frustrations, whatever, but they're just reacting on a behavioral level to those emotions differently. It's the only difference. I think a lot of retail traders think you're supposed to be cool and calm and not be bothered. And, you know, you're a warrior and all this kind of, mm, that's kind of BS. There's moments of that, you know, but in general, a very successful trader, uh, professional trader is going to be pretty much experiencing the same stuff that an unsuccessful trader is going to be experiencing. They're just reacting to it differently, behaviorally reacting to it differently. And when people hear that, that they're not actually that different in the, on an emotional kind of a level in terms of their experiences, it often helps. It's like, because they think there's something wrong with them. They often think they're defective. There's something wrong with me that I have FOMO. Well, you know what? The greatest traders in the world have FOMO. It's just they don't act out on it as much as someone else does. <laughs> so 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you're totally right in this. So I know people who try to control emotions. They try to stop having some feelings of fear or anything else. And that's just not working. You can try to do this for some time temporarily, but then over time it will always come back and you will always be stuck with these feelings. Yeah, the feelings are, we are primarily emotional creatures. Neuroscience has shown this for a number of years. I've been talking about it for a long time that uh, it has been verified by um, a lot of neurobiology experiments, but the brain creates emotion as a way to attend to all the amount, all the information that's coming in. We're getting a zillion bits of data, olfactory, kinetic, visual, auditory. It's a lot to process. One of the roles of um, that creating emotion does for us, having emotional experiences, it directs our attention to things. It's part of that survival mechanism that you know a lot of people talk about in trading psychology. So that evolutionary thing. So being able to understand how that works is a really important first step in trading psychology. It's not gonna be enough to change one's behavior, but you have to first get your arms around those concepts is a really good first step. What would you tell someone who's trading out of emotions these days, like stuck in that, that cycle, that trigger of always having emotion? Yeah, let's say they have fear, then they place trade right away to enter the market. What, what well, would you tell I mean, them to, all... to do and focus on? Yeah, I mean, so we're, I mean, to say that they have emotion, I mean, that's, if they didn't have emotion, they'd be dead. Uh, so I hope they have emotion. I hope everyone listening has emotion when they're trading. You don't want to be, have no emotions. Um, you won't be able to make a decision. There's good research showing that if that part of the brain that's involved in emotional processing and emotional generation is cut off from a lesion or an accident, a trauma, whatever, it's going to be really hard to make any kind of decision. So to answer your question, um, it's learning how to accept and process your emotion in real time, in real time. So there's less chance that you hit that buy or sell button in reaction to your emotion. Interesting. What would you say, like some people hear about these things online, maybe they take a course about mindset or about psychology yeah. and they try to apply this, but they're not really able to make anything stick. Like they're not able to really develop themselves with that. One thing yeah. that developing yourself and improving is so hard and, and how can yeah. you overcome that? It's really hard. I mean, I have this standalone course that I've had for a number of years that people buy. I mean, it's really hard to do this by yourself. That's why professionals hire me as a coach uh, is because they recognize that, hey, we have an ego. Everyone has an ego. And so it's very hard to be really honest with ourselves. For instance, here's a great example of a team that um, I think uh, everyone should, should really um, take to heart, which is when you make money on a trade, you need to be really honest with yourself. Was there a good quality process involved in that? Or was it an impulse trade that you made money on? Were you too big compared to what you should have been in terms of your money management? In other words, if you made money on something like that, uh, I call that a, a, type, uh, a type four trade, which is low quality process, but you had a nice outcome to it, made money. That will hold you back forever because you'll be promising yourself that that'll be the last time I do that. I I'm gonna just be a better trader now. Well, what will happen is very shortly, you'll be in a situation where you'll do the same thing again. And then you'll make that promise to yourself again. And then people will go around and around. You need, I, th I think it really helps. You don't need, but I, without having someone else who you can trust and be honest with and be open with, who can show you, kind of act as a mirror as to what's really happening on a psychological level for you. That's what the coaching, that's how that is really different than taking a course by yourself, you know, people do the course, they try a couple of techniques, it might work for a few days and they have a day where it doesn't seem to work and they give it up and they move on. And then a year later, they read a book or try something else and it works for a few days and it doesn't and they, they move on. That's the pattern that most people kind of follow with trading psychology. It's kind of like market approaches or strategies. They try something until it doesn't work and they try something else. Um, so it, it's, it's a, uh, you know, trading psychology is a big area. Most traders understand it's an important part of trading. Most traders will do something to it to address it, but they will not usually go to the point of committing themselves to doing something about it. And sometimes like buying a course or getting a book or going to some webinars is a statement about, I'm trying to make a commitment here, but it's not often enough to get them to actually learn to tolerate the discomfort, to begin to really, um, on a deep level, decouple uncertainty from risk to be able to decouple a process from outcome. Because if you're tied to your outcomes and you're an ego-based trader and 
good luck with that because ego-based traders aren't going to make it. So, Is coaching something that you do like one time for a certain period to improve something you want to work on? Or is it something you should do oh. like as a trader continuously all the oh, time? It depends. Depends. Well, I'll tell you, I can, you know, I have all my clients sign a confidentiality agreement because I don't use their names, but there's a few that give me permission to talk about them publicly. One professional trader I've known for many years, very good trader, Ed Vasta, trades at Schoenfeld. Um, and I've known Ed for a long time, maybe 10 years. What Ed will do, he'll contact me when he's something's gone off, when his game is not on for him. Um, and it could be maybe like several years ago, he is, his wife was pregnant with twins, completely affected him as a trader or something else affected him and he'll reach out to me. So I have like long-term relationships with a lot of my professional traders. They'll come to me for a specific thing, we work on it. And then maybe I don't hear from them for a while because things are great. And then something comes up, markets change, something changes in their life or both. And then we have more sessions again. So I have a lot of long-term relationships with hedge funds and professional clients. The retail people, not as much, um, not as much in terms of the long-term. I think they come in and they, they try and make something happen for themselves. They, they, they seem to have a timeline. You know, I want to, I could be profitable by a certain time. And, you know, that's, it that can be very problematic. Do you feel like timelines and goals are a good thing? Because you could have some professional traders with goals too, right? Do they, oh, you yeah. they said goals yeah. or goals something are, that they avoid? Goals are good, but I would say a, a P&L goal is not good. <laughs> you don't want to have like a this daily goal, the weekly goal. I mean, I understand where that stuff comes from. I understand why a lot of educators preach that because it has a lot of surface logic to it. Yeah, if I just focus on making X amount of dollars a day, once I hit that number, I'll turn off my machine, I'll walk away and I won't have the greed factor. Well, good luck with that because most people will trade anyways, they'll give it back. Plus, you know, the way I trade, um, I wanna have a, one or two really big days a month, perhaps. It's usually what happens to me. Why would I stop at a certain level? So um, having a PL goal, looking at your PL, focusing on your PL, the more you're doing that, the worse off you're gonna be. What a lot of professionals do, a lot of times what they'll do is they, Think in terms of risk units, units of risk. How many units of risk do I have on? How many units of risk do I want to have on? And that kind of thing and adding and trimming. It's not black or white. It's not, it's, it's a different kind of a game. What are some things that you see professional traders do that maybe retail traders don't think about or kind of ignore? Are there some, some habits uh, and things to think yeah. about? First, first and most biggest thing that stands out. Great question. Easy question. Risk management. Uh, most retail traders, majority of them, not all, but I'd say, and I, this is anecdotal based on all the emails that I get, people reaching out to me who have problems. I don't know most of these people, but I see their emails. More than two thirds of them are risk seekers. They, they don't have good, they talk about things like, I've got a good strategy, but I can't follow my plan. I, I have these impulse trades, or I have a hard time accepting the loss. So that tells me they're, they're not good risk managers. They're, they know how to make money. Most traders know how to make money. Making money, locating the opportunity is the relatively easy part of trading. I could teach my 10 year old neighbor to do that very easily probably in a couple of days. The hard part is risk management. So that's what separates often the professionals from everyone else is they're, they're focused on risk management because it's their job. It's their job on the line, so. Is there more risk management than most retail traders think about? Like for some people, it's just about like, oh, they're going to risk this amount per trade, but even though they do that, they might still fail. Are there some things that they have to think about in terms of risk management? Some things that maybe they don't, they don't see, or, or maybe just about like reducing their, because psychology in the end is also a risk. It's also a risk if you don't have the right mindset, the right habits, the right psychology, it's a risk for your trading. So how can you kind of work on that? Well, this is what's so tricky about, about trading is that, you know, the market, lulls us in. We look at our trading screens and there's price movement. We hear stories. We are on Twitter or and there's always somebody that seems to be making money or we see some opportunity that's some movement that in our mind equates to, to profit. And so most people uh, who are attracted to, to trading, pretty much everyone, what leads them into it is the opportunity, which is understandable and it makes sense. And, and, it, and that's really the way it really should be actually. But then it we need to have this idea of risk management that should go right along with, yes, I'm an opportunity seeker, but I'm also 
a risk manager. In fact, what it really needs to be is, you know, when somebody who's not a trader asks me like, what is trading? What, what is it about? And I tell them, well, first of all, I say, you probably, you know, think twice before you want to do it because it's going to be harder than you think. But the, the next thing I tell them is that really what it is, is you need to simultaneously do two things that are kind of, that don't seem to go well together at first, but eventually they do go well together. But what those two things are is you got to be able to simultaneously identify opportunity and manage the risk at the same time. Most people are not going to, are going to struggle with that. They're going to focus on, most people are going to focus more on the opportunity side. And you get about 30% of the retail traders out there, roughly a third, who are more on the risk averse side. And they, they're really overly focused on the risk management. They have a hard time pulling the trigger. They get out of a trade at the first sign of heat. They get out too early all the time. Um, and so there's that too, but that's less, you know, the overly risk managing, I'd say it's roughly about a third of the retail folks out there. And the other two thirds are overly risk seeking and focusing on opportunity. It's what I see. In terms of habits and improving as a trader, is it like, some people want to do journaling, that's, that's what they want to do. They think it can get better with that. And some people do. Is yeah. there like a way to journal, right? Oh yeah, there's a lot of before, ways. But that's pretty important. There's a lot of ways to journal. I mean, so, you know, there's different types of journaling. Um, I would say that, and this is something I actually don't call journaling, something a little different. Because journaling is really, what did I do? It's kind of like, what did I do after I did it? And being real, and then I would just say, if you journal, which is important to do, go back and read your journal on a regular basis, like every day. Read what you wrote yesterday. In the morning, read what you wrote yesterday. But I want to suggest another type of journaling. That's kind of after the fact journaling, live journaling in the moment, when you're in the heat of the moment, when you're wrestling with that, you know, what do I do? Do I get in? Do I not get in? Do I stay in? Do I stay, get out, stay out? In those moments, you need to be writing, what am I feeling? And why am I feeling? What's behind this? Why am I feeling it? When have I felt this way before? What is this feeling tempting me to do? Is that consistent with what I want it to do? And you need to do it with a pen or pencil, not keyboard it. And you got to do it live and you got to be really honest and not try and write like what you're supposed to be doing. It's not about a post-it note that says, be patient or don't be greedy or follow your plan. Because those self-admonitions, got to get some rest there, man. The self-admonitions <laughs> don't work. Um, Everyone has tried them and they don't work. Um, but what I'm suggesting doesn't work all the time, but it's your best chance. I know some people, not myself, because I like journaling myself, but some people don't like journaling or it's difficult for them to sit down and write something about their trading or anything else. Is there a solution for them? Is it like a voice <laughs> recording or something or, or what else can they do yeah. to get the same benefit? I would, yeah, I mean, that's, I know I, I hear this from people too um, all the time. It kind of surprises me because it's like, you know, when someone's coming to trading, you have to ask yourself, well, if it's not going well, what do I have to do to improve? And I'm um, hearing that journaling helps. Well, then the question then becomes, so why am I not journaling? And then the next question could be become, is this person really not wanted? Is there some subconscious part of them that's kind of sabotaging themselves that doesn't want to do the work of journaling? Why don't they journal? It's not rocket science. It's not technically difficult. Um, I think what it does is it reveals things about uh, ourselves that we may not want to see, we may not want to know, perhaps. That's part of the discomfort, right? I mentioned earlier, it's part of the tolerating discomfort, which is, you know, the more you can do that, the more resilience you can build, the better off you're going to be as a trader. I know some psychologists are looking at into, like you mentioned, like childhood issues, yeah. something that came up in the past for yeah. how it can affect trading now. Is it something you look at also and how, like, how can you oh, work yeah. with that? We, we bring our entire being with us, our entire personality, not just our personality, but even our body. There's a lot of physical stuff. Yeah, the childhood stuff, the way that figures into it, a teen, is that figures into it in a lot of ways. But one of the ways is, one of the big ways is from birth onward, we develop coping strategies, coping styles. Sometimes in psychology, we call it defense mechanisms, way to kind of protect our ego, protect ourselves from difficult situations. And when we're, you know, we develop strategies, whether the strategy is to retreat or to yell or to whatever it is, you know, we have these defense mechanisms, all kinds of them. And they're attempts to survive and get through the situation. And, you know, as we get older, what happens is we tend to keep those same strategies and then we bring them with us into our trading. They might look a little different, but it's really the same thing happening. And so it's learning about what are my more adaptive and what are my more maladaptive coping strategies? And how can I have more adaptive ones 
for my trading and drop the ones that are more maladaptive that I had long ago. You know, classic example, it doesn't even come from childhood, would be, you know, the person who grows up really good at math and logic and becomes a programmer. And it's like they go to trading and oftentimes, not always, but those people tend to be a little bit more on the risk averse side, but not always. I see some of them can be crazy risk seekers too, but they tend to be a little bit more, you know, things have to be just right, just lined up just right in order to, to be in the trade and for the trade to keep working for them. Um, so that's an example of learning about, you know, anything that's, that's not black or white is there's a problem and I need to avoid that problem. That's a maladaptive coping strategy right there. So it works in a lot of ways, but childhood stuff, you know, the other one, the other big one besides the coping strategies is how one responds to and experiences authority figures. You know, that's the other real big one. Yeah, the market is an authority figure for all of us traders, regardless of how big you are. I've, I've worked with traders who are the biggest trader in their own market and, and they still get pushed around and have problems. The market giveth and taketh away. You, you, can't, you can't tell the market what to do. That means the market is the ultimate authority figure for us traders. And how we, our first earliest experiences of authority creates a template for how we're gonna feel about authority, experience authority and react to authority. Very often when I get to know a trader really well, it takes more than a few sessions. I need to really get in there and learn a lot about them, their background, what they're doing now and how they grew up. 90% of the time I'm able to find, and, I'm, and the client is, up, is able to see with me when I show that to them, how they are experiencing the market so similarly as they experienced some type of an authoritarian dynamic earlier in their life. It's really interesting. That's quite fascinating, I have to admit. Now, could you give us an example of, of these adaptive ways or yeah. adaptive habits for training? Yeah. Sometimes you might not see them yourself. You have to have an outside perspective to see what you're yeah. doing right in trading. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's, it's like, you know, and sometimes what was maladaptive in, in outside of trading could actually become an adaptive coping strategy in your trading. Good example would be for the person who tends to like shy away from conflict or doesn't like difficulty or something like that, that could be a maladaptive coping strategy for them in their life. Maybe they don't have a girlfriend or boyfriend or can't find a significant other, or they don't have a social life because they're, they retreat every time things, they get anxious that may have protected them and helped them to some degree. So they feel safe in their life, but then they, you know, come to trading and that can actually, actually be, well, that could be a problem in their personal life. Also, they're not satisfied, but in trading can actually work to their benefit, being able to step away, knowing when to retreat. I'm okay with that. Right. I'm not talking about me personally, because that's not my personal coping strategy, but people who have that, that can, be, it can benefit them. Um, so there's, there's, um, you know, learning how to develop the right ways of coping with all the stresses that will normally be there in trading, regardless of how good you are, you're still going to be experiencing a lot of stresses, missing out, waiting. What do I do with this trade? It's winning, but I'm, it may not win for much longer. What All the dilemmas we face continuously, one after another, plus all the ambiguous data. That you know, that's a, an example. It's an interesting example of how that strategy may have not worked for them that well in their personal life. But in trading, knowing when to be risk, knowing when to avoid. You know, if you're like have an avoidant personality, some ways that can help you as a trader. Perhaps you know, if you can turn that into, oh, this is not my kind of market. There's too much volatility. I don't want to deal with this. That's okay. There's nothing wimpy about that at all. If you're not feeling good to trade, you shouldn't be trading. Um, so yeah. How do you turn something like this that can be a disadvantage or a maladaptive strategy to a good strategy for trading? How do you kind of flip this around? Is it something you have to reduce when it's not helping you and improve when it's helping you? Or how do you kind of turn that around? Boy, what do you mean? I mean, like a, a, a good, when you say a good strategy. What so do you, if you have a maladaptive strategy, you want to turn it into a adaptive strategy, right? To help you in trading. Well, Is there a way you can may or may not around? be able to. Okay, I think I got your question. You may or may not be able to turn that a, any specific maladaptive strategy into an adaptive one. So first you got to look at, well, what was that maladaptive strategy serving? What was that strategy serving to do? What was the positive intention behind it? All of these coping strategies have a positive intention. Sometimes it's a hidden positive intention. What is that subconscious underlying motivation? Is that going to be consistent? That motivation consistent with what you're trying to, what you're dealing with as a trader? Well, if it is, then maybe we can kind of port that strategy over into trading and work, tweak it to 
so it becomes more adaptive. Well, maybe that underlying motivation behind that strategy is not going to translate well on the trading. So that would be, let's, we need to throw that one out and develop something else. So it really depends on the situation. This is also why, you know, like one-on-one -on -one coaching is, can, it can often be more effective because this is the kind of stuff you can't get in some pre-packaged module kind of a thing necessarily. It's, it can be really hard to sort that out and to be honest with yourself and, and our ego is going to, um, um, I'm not going to say it's going to trick us, but because I don't want people to think they're at war with themselves because we're all, we're a cohesive being, but there's going to be different um, dynamics that need to be attended to. And it can be, um, it's challenging to do that by yourself. It really is. Yeah. From my experience of working with the coach and trying to do it alone also whether at different times, I think having a coach definitely helped a lot in that case. And I think that's something, especially for the mindset, like your strategies can learn in a book can learn a little bit more but the mindset part and yeah the psychology is really hard to master yourself i think yeah and I, and I think this is why people who are already successful this is the other interesting thing i probably should have said earlier is that what i've been noticing as time goes on and since we last spoke five and a half six years ago i'm seeing it more and more and more is the majority of the people that come to me for coaching are people who have already been successful now not, not everybody who reaches out to me is already successful but i'm seeing more of that and why is that I think it's because they know what it takes to maintain their success and they're willing to do what it takes. It's probably also why I have more professional trader clients than the non, might way more. Um, and also why, I, and I'm doing this now for the last few years, I'm really limiting how many kind of retail traders I might take on in my coaching practice at any one time. Um, in fact, right now I have a waiting list for that. I don't have any availability for that because it's, it's, it's a different kind of work for me. What are some of the advantages retail traders have over the professional traders? Like you might think professionals are way ahead of retail traders, but are there may some or may things not that be. depends? Yeah. Yeah. Are there some things retail traders are able to do more of, or they're more flexible? Hmm. Maybe they're able to trade less yeah. or trade on the terms. Yeah. Great question. So here's an, there's some really powerful edges that independent retail at home traders have that professionals, well, they may be trading at home now too, don't have. If you're not managing money, you have some incredible edges to you. One of them is you can trade whatever market you want. If you're working at a fund, you have a mandate and there are certain styles of trading that you have to work within. So you can trade whatever you want. You can trade when you want. You can also decide not to trade for, oh, I don't feel good today or this week, or I'm too tired or whatever it is. So the ability to choose when and where and how you're gonna trade is most people don't recognize and realize how much uh, edge there actually isn't that. I, I have a market maker I'm working with right now, actually, um, one of the major banks, one of the big five banks. And, uh, you know, he's really constrained on what he can do. And he's, you know, really constrained. And, um, you know, and he's contemplating moving to the buy side, you know, going from a bank to a hedge fund. I, I've actually, that's probably 80% of the professional traders I've worked with are people who are transitioning from the sell side, working on a trade desk at a bank often, moving to the buy side at a hedge fund. Um, very different experience, but yeah, you got to be very, um, um, I lost my, my train of thought on that, but it's a very different kind of a game than for a retail trader. And, but the retail traders have this advantage that they ignore, you know what, if you're tired, if you're sleep deprived, it's going to change your perception of risk. Most likely two thirds of the time, you're going to be more risk seeking is, is what usually happens. So if you're an at home, you know, retail trader, and you only got a few hours of sleep last night, then you shouldn't be trading. But if you're working on a trading desk, you're expected to be operating in the market. So there is actually retail folks have advantages, but they don't use the advantages. It's kind of, it frustrates me to know and to see retail traders over trading and trading constantly when they shouldn't be because they don't need to. And that's their edge is to know when not to. <laughs> and so they, and they completely ignore that edge. It's a powerful edge. Good to hear for sure. I'm curious to hear what are some of the challenges for people who go from a bank, let's say, to a hedge fund? Uh, what are some things? Because you might think a trader is a trader, they can do whatever they want and trade anywhere, yeah. but well, they, they probably have a big list of challenges to go through. Well, one of the big ones is just like in a real practical matter. So when you're working at a bank, you have pretty much use have a fat salary, then you get a bonus based upon a combination of your performance and the firm's performance and maybe your desk's performance. And but when you go to a, the buy side, you go to a hedge fund, your salary, take a big salary haircut, 
much lower base salary, but then your bonus potentially is much bigger and it's more tied to your performance. So all of a sudden, what I usually will often see common, it's not always the case, but more than half the time is somebody transitioning from the sell side to the buy side ends up becoming really risk averse. Often, not always, but they usually start off with their new hedge fund as a, as a new PM at a hedge fund, a new portfolio manager. Often, you know, I remember I've talked with guys at big funds, you know, name brand kind of funds, and they're super small and they know they need to get bigger, but they're just, you know, they want to get their sea legs and they want to get used to this idea that their income is really tied to their PL now. Whereas at the bank, you know, they were still going to get a nice salary. Um, it's different. Yeah. Interesting. I know we covered a lot here in this interview and I want to respect your time. So where can people find you? They connect with you or reach out after the interview. We can do a little more about what you yeah. do. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I don't do YouTube. Maybe I should. I, I'm, I'm not trying to attract a bunch of retail people, but my website, andrewmenneker.com. By the way, I don't want to scare retail people away. I mean, I do work with some and we, I will reply if people email me. I may not be within a day or two, but I always get back to all my emails. Um, yeah, andrewmenneker.com. In fact, there's a lot of good information on there. Some good white papers on my, uh, I think it's called the insights and ideas area. Some really important white papers that, to be honest with you, like there's some professional trading desks that actually study my white papers. It's interesting, but retail folks are like, huh, well, that's kind of interesting. Eh, it's more than interesting. The boom and bust cycle, follow the money, to uh, follow emotions to find the money and those two particular uh, uh, white papers, really important. I think retail traders should read them. Awesome. And if they have a look at them, I didn't read them. Yeah. Yet, so yeah. And then there's a third one about trading OPM, trading other people's money, which is not for retail, but those white papers, it'll open your eyes to what trading is all about. That's really cool. I'll have a look. Yeah. So we'll put a link below the video for you people to check it out, of course. Thank you. I really appreciate your time as always. I think yeah. you added a lot of value here. I think people will love this. And I hope yeah. you can well, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll see you in another five and a half years. <laughs> Hopefully sooner. Yeah. <laughs> Well, take care. Thanks for inviting awesome. me. Thank you. Bye.